Welcome and aloha. I'm Mark Schlav, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. You know, we, we all encounter rough seas in life and in our professions. Lawyers must deal with both failure and success in their personal lives and law practices. Sometimes we go through hell. I've often been encouraged by the words of Winston Churchill when sailing through rough and unpredictable seas in my life and law practice. Churchill was not perfect. He made many mistakes and held prejudices. He was human, but he had a way of persisting and using words that is encouraging to everyone facing adversity, especially maybe in today, today's times. Churchill is quoted as saying, history is written by the victors. And Churchill wrote that history. I've asked professor of history, Peter Hoffenberg to discuss Churchill's history and legacy. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, welcome, thanks for inviting me. Good, good to see you. Uh, Peter, I, I grew up learning about Winston Churchill from my parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the, the younger generations may not have been as familiar as I am with him. How, how would you describe Winston Churchill? So I would say Winston Churchill is probably the most well-known British politician of the 20th century. And well-known not just in the United States, but really throughout the English-speaking world. And if, if I were teaching a course with uh, students who are interested, I would say we want to think of him primarily in a political sense, but a political sense with a very strong understanding of history. So rather than what is new is good, uh, what is new is suspicious and should always be applied thinking about the past. I would say also he was of an era which I don't think we can appreciate, which is uh, an era of not sound bites. That's how we know him like the famous quote you gave him, you gave of him, but he was a brilliant orator. So in a way, I would say, if you want to understand Churchill, uh, understand Lincoln, who also brought to his orations a very strong understanding of language. So a Lincoln, contrary to rumor, rewrote Gettysburg Address three or four times. It wasn't spontaneous. And the recent film that some of us, of your viewers might have seen about Churchill, shows you how painfully he edited his speeches. So I would think the most famous political leader in the English speaking world, a great orator, uh, and somebody who understood, while oration was important, the very careful use of the English language. That didn't always mean the most honest use. Uh, you could see how uh, Shakespeare's blood flowed through Churchill. I hope that helps us just an introduction. There's a lot more to him, right? Well, you know, and, and you talked about him being so famous and uh, well known and I guess successful, but he had a lot of quotes about <laughs> failure also. And some of his most inspirational quotes I want to share. Uh, first, first one, uh, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. That, that, that one, uh, as, especially as a lawyer, I, I, I like. And then, then the, the second one uh, that he talks about success and failure is success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. So, so here we have Churchill talking about failure a lot. And, and uh, I, I've often referred to these as I practice law, uh, but what, what did Churchill mean? Well, what was he talking about failure? What, what were his, his failures and how does it link with success? Okay, I think there are probably at least three ways to think about failure. And I think that the audience will also understand. I mean, one is, did he live up to his family's and his father's expectations? Uh, his father was a bright shining star. And as Shakespeare reminds us, right, the brighter you are, the faster uh, you'll be extinguished. And his father ended up being a failure. But there were great expectations. After all, Blood and Palace, his home, was named after the most famous English general of the 18th century. So failure was in light of what the family expected of him. 
Secondly, uh, I think failure was in light of his own uh, mental stability. He had a deep periodic depression, uh, which he called his black dog. And so in a sense of personal failure, right? Am I achieving as an individual what I know I should or am I being held back by something that I think I should control? And one of the ways to control that we know is through his drinking. And that's not unique, okay? And thirdly, um, when historians, uh, like Lincoln, again, Churchill is, is a figure that's so famous and so influential. Most historians uh, and most people bring a certain prejudice to the discussion. So I wanna throw the prejudice aside and simply saying that failure and success to him was also in a macro way. Did the empire survive? Did the party survive? Would England survive? And so among his uh, failures, he referred to one, Gallipoli. Uh, there was an equivalent in the Second World, World War. There are actually two, really, the Epp and the Norway fiasco. Those were uh, significant strategic failures. So I think in a way what he's arguing is um, life is a column of successes and a column of failures. Um, it's up to other people to judge. So we can look back and some people say that uh, Churchill's failures outweigh his successes. And other people say, you know, his successes outweigh his failures. But nobody who's a decent historian doesn't say that they're, they're both two columns. And to his credit, like to Lincoln's credit, he was conscious. He, these were figures with uh, such a refined ego that they could understand where they failed. You know, other people have an ego, which it's always somebody else's fault, or, you know, it's, I didn't make a mistake. But with Churchill and Lincoln both, they're very self-conscious about their decisions, about their mistakes. Uh, they both went to their graves, you know, regretting. Uh, Ch Churchill regretted Gallipoli. He wasn't, he didn't throw it under the carpet. You know, he regretted it both personally and uh, strategically. And there were others that, of Churchill's as well, which we can talk about. Um, and other successes and other failures, which are not quite well, as well known. Yeah, I, I, and, and he recognized that he had failures. I mean, mm, he, absolutely. he acknowledged that and 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 still he had these words of encouragement that I that I like. I mean, you know, basically, uh, you know, it's the courage to continue that counts. And you know, don't lose your enthusiasm. I mean, he he was trying to tell us something. And I want to go back a little bit in his life when he as a child. And we have some photos of him as a child. Uh, you know what what. What was that like? And what did he have some setbacks then also? Well, I think he had some setbacks in ways, again, I, mean, I, I don't know, you know enough of his personal life, but I know enough as a British historian. Uh, he had a family setback in that his relationship with his father was difficult. Uh, his mother was American, which people know, and, and she was part Native American. So I, I think he did not have the family life that a quote unquote normal child of his class would have had. So that's, that's a struggle. Uh, let's be honest, he was no AP student. He never really, <laughs> he read, and I think he absorbed what he read, but that doesn't mean he necessarily analyzed it. I think he had an academic setback. So I would say those, uh, in, a, in a sense, and I don't want to be careful with my words here, um, late 19th century Victorian Britain was to a sense a caste society. And I don't want people to think about India, but I just want them to think about a class society in which you're born into the class and you're expected to act a certain way. The First World War really does away with that. And he was born into a class and um, you know, he went into the army. That was, that was what the not so bright son did. I mean, the bright son was supposed to go into politics, which he eventually did, right? But it but the bright son, the son of Sir Randolph Churchill, should have been become, when he was 20 to 25, a member of parliament for the Tory party. That would have been his cast role. Well, I want, I want to reflect a little bit on, more on, on his childhood. I know he had a speech impediment. Yes. And uh, I know that, uh, I mean, it's been called a lisp or a stutter or a stammer. Not quite sure w which one it was. Uh, I've always heard it was more like a stutter. Uh, or a lisp, or both. 
Um, and I also, like you say, I know he was not the best pupil in his class. <laughs> uh, and there's a quote uh, I want to put up about that, that he, I, I would say it's somewhat humorous uh, that, he, that he liked to uh, talk about. Uh, and, and let's put that next quote up. Uh, by being so long in the lowest form, which is the lowest grade, I guess, in school. Right. You, I think think rank, you think of rankings, like in high school, you take an accelerated versus, and to be a low form um, was not a point of pride. That was pretty embarrassing. Okay, let's go back to the quote. So by being so long in the lowest form, I gained an immense advantage <laughs> over the cleverer boys. They all went on to learn Latin and Greek and splendid things like that. But I was taught English. We were considered such dunces that we could learn only English. And, I, and I'm sure that Churchill, seems to me he must have been smiling when he said that because how, how, how did English help him? Well, I think um, what he's saying, if uh, let me read, read, read a little bit into that quote, is that a couple things. Uh, one is, sure, you, you, know, you read Seneca and you read Caesar, but I know my Shakespeare. I know how to use and manipulate and call upon the English language. And the first English dictionary in 1751, over 25,000 entries were directly from Shakespeare. So I think that's one thing, which is, you know, I, I know the language of the people, I know the language of politics. But I think also we need to recognize that as a political claim, that for the Tory and conservatives to be a vibrant political party, they can't rely upon this elitist heritage of Oxford, Cambridge, knowing Greek and Latin, knowing what Caesar did. So I think also there's a built-in political admission, and that's part of the Tory party since the mid 19th century to be the party of, of the people. Uh, thirdly, I think running through Churchill is um, a slight jealousy. Uh, he's really not an intellectual. Uh, he writes, he paints. I know he does all those things, but he's not an intellectual. And people like Waugh and Keynes, those of who were his colleagues and uh, his contemporaries, never thought of him. And he had a little chip on his shoulder about that. I see. Um, you, you also mentioned the Boer War. Uh, what, what happened to Churchill in the Boer War? So that's a very good example. I'm glad you brought it up. Something he shouldn't be doing. He's the son of a prominent a failed politician, and he goes out, uh, we, we think as a journalist, from what we can tell uh, as a journalist, but he had already been in Africa covering the Anglo-Sudanese War. So he's what we would call a war correspondent, right? He's not out there studying politics. He's leading uh, the life that was the most common genre of the time, which were boys' adventure stories. And that's what he's leading. But it's really not for uh, a conservative aristocratic politician's son. So he goes out there. And here again, it depends who you ask. He was captured by the Boers, the military and political opponents. But nobody's quite sure if he did not also put himself in a position to be captured. OK? And I, I don't want people to quote me in any way as a source other than there's a question about it. He ends up, of course, uh, being in prison, which is a great adventure, right? And um, it's at a time before the war turned ugly. Now, the war did turn really ugly, where people would have been tortured and boys were executed. So uh, he escapes and it becomes a boy's adventure. And that allows him to have a little niche back home because the Boer War corresponded uh, in a great time period for journalists, an explosion of popular press, uh, Americans talk about uh, Hearst and the Spanish-American War, right? The, the explosion of the Maine. They talk about how uh, uh, Hearst helped promote the war. Well, the Daily Mail and other newspapers back in England helped promote the Boer War. So it was a real nice synergy, right? Popular interest, uh, articulate journalist, boy's adventure, a name that was recognized. Um, and he escapes and he comes back home, not as a military hero, but, you know, as an adventurer, and probably some of your audience would know that the founder of the Boy Scouts was there with them, Aidan Powell. So that oh, really? fits into, yeah, Baden Powell was in Nafaki, uh, a British uh, city that, that was besieged by the Boers for months and months and months. 
So the idea of adventure is, is out there. You know, it's uh, King Solomon's Mines by a writer Haggard and she and the, the British, uh, illiterate Brit British, which ran up and down uh, the class system, uh, just swallowed and consumed adventure stories. And Churchill was like Indiana Jones. <laughs> he was a living adventure. So he kind of uh, gained a, a good reputation or uh, maybe a, he, it helped him. Okay, he, he gained a reputation, but there were some who said, you know, this is not what you should be doing. Um, <laughs> getting captured is not necessarily a good thing, but you're right, he, he, has a, he had a name. So you could read about him in the newspaper. So he, he transcended, when you read Churchill now, rather than reading about his decaying father who was dead, but still kind of a ghost on the shoulder of the Tories, you read a more po a positive version, certainly of the Churchill family. And uh, I, I want to put up another uh, quote that he uh, is attributed to Churchill. Uh, and the one I really like, it's a good one for lawyers, especially. Uh, if you, and I mean, I, if Churchill, Churchill could have been a senior lawyer in a law firm, giving <laughs> advice to young lawyers, it seems to me. He says, if you're going through hell, keep going. And I don't know if this was a result of his experiences up to this date in the Boer War, but uh, it seems like a, a great, great advice. I mean, just again, like his success and failure quotes, just persevere, keep on going. Um, what, what happened to him after uh, he came back to England from the Boer War? And there's a photo of him shortly after. Right. So he, he is on the edge of uh, what today we call the Conservative or Tory Party. And he's on the edge. He, he's, a, he's a recognized name. Um, this is a family, though, where he does not have to work nine to five. So you don't have to worry about Churchill putting food on, on the plate. Um, he is, I would say, uh, a figure, but not a significant political figure. And part of that is uh, there are, as usual, uh, hurricanes and storms and tsunamis within the British political system. Um, he plays a role. But Ireland is something that divides him from others. He's in charge of the Home Department during the only general strike in British history in 1926. And he puts that down through coercion and force. He puts down his Home Secretary uh, rebellion in Ireland through coercion and force. So uh, he has a role. Um, the role is a bit, and again, if people are listening and know more about Churchill, I gladly welcome any uh, criticism and correction, um, he's a little bit of an enforcer. The Home Secretary is a bit like FBI and justice combined in Britain. So uh, workers are shot at in the streets uh, under his command in 1926, and Ireland explodes in 2021. So I would say he has a role. He's not on the path towards being the prime minister by any means at all. And he, kept, he continues a long tradition in the Tory Conservative Party of having very famous, influential people who were never really accepted by the party. Edmund Burke, the famous philosopher of the 18th century, was like that. We know Edmund Burke, but we have to remember that he was never able to put together a coalition. He never would have been elected prime minister. So when we get to your questions about prime minister, his being the prime minister, Churchill's, that's a surprise. Well, let, let's talk about, I mean, he, he had some success in politics, but then the First World War happened and there's success and failures. What, what, what I, think most, I think we have to be honest, uh, evaluating Churchill during the First World War is uh, a conflict, you would have to say the failure, the, the, the overwhelming significance and scope of the failure uh, pretty much blinds anybody to successes. The failure, what, what, as you mentioned, the failure, as you mentioned, was an attempt to open up and defeat the Ottomans uh, and thereby uh, easing pressure, maybe keeping Russia in the war, opening up the Mediterranean. And the idea was to have an amphibious landing at what we all know as uh, Gallipoli. Uh, Gallipoli involved British, Turkish, French, Australian, New Zealand troops. And like Dieppe and Norway, uh, it was a absolute failure militarily, but a failure which um, costs considerable number of lives, considerable, and which uh, fomented a fair amount of anger, especially among Australians, 
who still uh, believe that the Australians were sacrificed uh, to save the British. Uh, so it, I, I, nobody, nobody won that battle, except interestingly enough, the first president of modern Turkey, who we know as Kemal Ataturk, who the Muslims know as Mustafa Kemal. He was one of the top commanders at Kota. So it's one of these sign, you know, synergies that Churchill and Ataturk meet. That was one of the examples that then led to Churchill being uh, in the political frontier. He was home secretary during the general strike, but again, as I say, not really uh, within a hair's breadth of the prime minister's seat. And during the 30s, he's really on the political out. Well, you know, go, going back to World War II, I know that he, he, he lost his position, I think it was first Lord of the Admiralty. Yes. And then he, he went, but he went on to serve. And here's a photo of him uh, as a commanding officer of the 6th Battalion Royal Scots Fusiliers. But, you know, he, he, he kept on, kept on going, kept going. He certainly kept going. Um, and that's an interesting way to put it. Um, why? Uh, I, well, first of all, he knew that uh, he knew Gallipoli was a failure. There was no attempt to, again, sweep it under the carpet. Um, ever since he was a kid and played with soldiers, and when you read his histories, there is much military histories as political histories. He's an old fashioned, and I don't mean that in derogatory or pejorative way. He, he's, he's out of Herodotus and Thucydides. History is the story of war and politics. And to his credit or discredit, um, he wanted to participate in those. Uh, but unlike Washington, perhaps uh, <laughs> he was able to be successful in both, even though Washington had lots of failures too. Um, but there was a drive to prove himself. There was a drive to become um, part of history. So not just observing, like a professor like myself, where you just observe. But he, <laughs> wanted to, he wanted to become part of history. Um, some people in this class thought of part of history as doing social legislation, feeding the poor, going out to the empire. These are all parts of history. For him, it, it was, uh, at this point in his life, war, serving. And let's, um, we also need to remember, I think, that even though the First World War was very controversial, um, many people still thought of it as a war for the empire and a war for patriotism. Uh, dissenters and pacifists were jailed, sometimes shot. So we also, we have to understand in light of the, the First World War, what he did, not post First World War, not World War II. Well, okay, so it looks like he followed his own advice. Uh, he, 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 had the, he continued, he had the courage to continue and he didn't lose his enthusiasm, it appears. Uh, now, how did he become prime minister in World War II? How did that come about? And, and what okay, did it look so like? I think some of your audience probably remembers and, and might have even seen the film. So let me just do it very briefly. Uh, from about 35 onward, 1935 onward, uh, the most fundamental political debate really in the West was do, do you appease the Germans, the Italians, and the Japanese? That is, let them have what they want with the hope of not getting anything more, or do you arm? and confront them. And Churchill was on the political outs in Britain at the time period, because most of the people in the 1930s, and I want to be very clear about this, remembered vividly the First World War. By far more soldiers were killed in the West in the First World War than in World War II. 10 to 12 million soldiers died. The Australian army had a 90% casualty rate the First World War. So the fascists were up and going and they're ready to fight. But Britain, France, etc., wanted to avoid fighting. And I think we have to appreciate that. Secondly, to Churchill's credit, and to discredit everybody else, Churchill understood that fascism was a monster that had to continue to eat. And you couldn't appease it. So as we move towards the later 30s, in Japan, Italy, and Germany are grabbing land. They're expanding. We have what all of your, all the folks of our age will remember in one way or another, the Munich crisis. 
where Czechoslovakia is divided up, given to the Germans, Sudetenland and the rest of Czechoslovakia, without the Czechs being present. And the Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain comes home, waves a piece of white paper, and says, we have peace in our time. And of course, he did not, and they did not. And Chamberlain was forced to call a vote and resign as Prime Minister. The next person in line was Lord Halifax. And Halifax, as you might remember, was part of a surprisingly, although I don't, as a British historian, I don't find it surprising, large group of not only appeasers, but Nazi sympathizers. Mm. And he could have become Prime Minister. I cannot tell you what happened in the back room. I can't tell you precisely what happened. But the next in line was not really inclined, and Churchill was there. Everybody thought this was a joke. <laughs> the king didn't like Churchill. Nobody really liked Churchill. But Chamberlain could not continue. He was humiliated. Right? Hitler continued to expand. He was humiliated. Halifax did not have enough backing of the, of the party. And so Churchill walks in. The king admits, uh, you, you have to, the, the monarch has to agree to the person becoming prime minister. So which much chagrin and doubt, which is later replaced by uh, a budding friendship, probably in part because they both stuck. Some probably that was part of it. Uh, he becomes prime minister, and everybody expects that what Halifax wanted will happen, that there will be peace with Germany. And that's a very unusual route to somebody on the political outside, but it happens again, uh, maybe because your audience knows that um, British politics are multi-party politics. So it's not Democrats versus Republicans, right? It's conservatives and liberals and the liberal party split between liberal uni unionists who wanted to keep Ireland and did not. So you had to put together a coalition as you still do today, as is happening in Germany right now. The SDP did not win the election outright. And Churchill in part becomes prime minister because he can get enough votes from the different parties. And that, that's a short story. The only final addition I would add is until, until the Hong Kong protesters of two years ago waved their umbrellas, I don't remember the umbrella protests, uh, the umbrella in Britain was a no-no because Chamberlain, while waving his white piece of paper, carried his umbrella. And no British politician would be seen with an umbrella in Britain because it was connected with Chamberlain until the Hong Kong rebellion. Just a little tidbit for anybody who goes to a cocktail party. Let, let's take a look at Churchill uh, with his V for victory. That's what he would- uh, Right, remember he had to switch that though. He had to switch it. It's the first time he used it. It, it was uh, not exactly that on the part of Italian allies. It had the exit, it, it was uh, humbuyu, uh, and politely. So Churchill had to reverse the B. Okay. That, that was part of his, that was part of his non-worldly, I mean, Again, I mean, somebody well-educated who appreciated right, European differences would have known that. But he was, he was kind of parochial in his own way. And, I, but, and, and then he had a great, another great quote that I want to put up on, uh, here uh, that he gave to a talk of his, at his high school, I guess, Harrow. And uh, never give in, never give in, never, 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 in nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense, never yield to force, never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. And he gave this after he'd been prime minister and was giving a talk at his, at, at his school that he graduated from. And this is another good adv advice for lawyers. Uh, you know. It, what, what, what prompted this, do you think? I think, again, a, a couple of things, but most urgently. And, you know, sometimes it's best just to focus on the obvious, like not try to be too clever. Uh, this was a dark hour. Um, Americans felt that way, you know, after Pearl Harbor, but that wasn't the mainland. There really was not going to be a serious invasion. There were real worries and legitimate worries that Britain was not prepared, 
was not prepared militarily, that the Nazis were an unstoppable force, and that what the Britain was facing was in fact overwhelming force, overwhelming force which most sensible Brits recognized was evil. Anarant and other philosophers, you know, understood that fascism had a moral or ethical component. It was an evil moral or ethical component. But if you were like Churchill or the kids at Harrow and you were playing with toy soldiers, your side had no chance, no chance. And in a way, what he's doing, uh, which is what kind of FDR had to do, right? America wasn't prepared for World War II, but America had time. Britain had no time. America had a good year, year and a half before U.S. could counterattack. And during that year and year and a half, other than living on the edge of the Pacific, you were secure. The Germans are in the Channel Islands. Once they conquer Belgium, you know, you're, you are a relatively brief bomber run from Britain. So I, I don't think actually we need to get a, the uh, PhD in psychology or postmodernist to see that, like Wellington said, you know, uh, the fields of Harrow and Exeter are where Britain's going to win its battles. There's no large standing army. He's talking to kids whose fathers, older brothers, and probably them are all going to have to put on uniforms. They're all going to have to fight. Um, now, there are other, I mean, I think psychologists can find other reasons. You know, fighting through fear is also fighting through depression, right? It's fighting through his, his uh, uh, black dog. But I think quite clearly, uh, and the recent films do this very well, it, it's not subtle. I mean, how are you going to get, you can think of some of Lincoln's early speeches. You know, the Union's not ready for a war. You can see that in battle first full run. So, so he's trying to encourage the younger generation. Uh, and, trying and, to and, and, and I think also their parents. You know, ah. you're, I think, I mean, he's smart enough to know, and this is very Shakespearean. This is really right out of Shakespeare, right? If you talk to kids about a war, you're not just talking to kids about themselves. You're talking about their older brothers. Mm -hmm. You're talking about their parents and their uncles. And Britain needed women. Women were not on the front line, but needed women. Women played very important roles. So, you know, you are, you're not talking about a military caste that is by itself. You're talking about a nation, trying to get, trying to get a nation to go to war. Let's take a look at the final quote and ask you, you know, what is Churchill talking about and what is his legacy? We have a couple minutes left. Sure. A nation that forgets its past has no future. What, what's he talking about? What's his legacy? I'll let you conclude, bring this Okay, I hope I, let me know if I answer it uh, the way you'd like. I think, I think um, his idea there is, and it's a conservative tradition. And again, I don't mean conservative in a pejorative way, I'm just being the capital C, back to Edmund Burke, back to Shakespeare, uh, that societies that radically change with no connection to their past are gonna fall apart. And so whether or not you bring all the past to bear, you have to understand the past to be able to make the changes necessary for the future, right? So it's not a radical view where you just cut yourself off from the past. Uh, I think also when he's writing that uh, very intelligently, I mean, one of the things he did recognize uh, was that the future was not going to be a future where Britain and the British Empire were at the center. Uh, he promised not to oversee the liquidation of an empire, but he recognized that uh, the British Empire in the 19th and early 20th century was gone. Britain's role in the world was gone. So how do you adjust to that? And one of the ways I think he said adjusting to that is to know your own history, be confident with knowing that, but seeing the future is not a mirror image or a Polaroid reproduction of that. Now, having said that, let's be clear. Churchill uh, was not anti-imperial. Churchill and most of his colleagues hoped that many British interests would be represented by the US. Uh, but on the other side, there's a lot of suspicion. FDR uh, had very different views of the world than Churchill did, very different views. FDR and De Gaulle disagreed about the future of the world. And the American Treasury and Keynes did not agree. So history is important for Britons to be able to accept a new role and also in general 
it's important as models. So the way in which you're using the quotes to try to understand Churchill, you would say that's proper. Use my quotes from the past to help guide the future. Okay, so don't, yeah. you know, don't just separate yourself from the past. In, in the one minute we have left, let's we'll put up some photos of Churchill in his later years. In the one minute we have left, Professor, <laughs> what can we learn today from this? From the later years. What can we learn today? Today, oh, today from Churchill. From Churchill. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. I, I think the um, problems we're going through, the failures, the going through hell today. What can we learn? Okay. Very, very quickly. Uh, one is to uh, recognize uh, that there is no absolute victory. And there's, there are probably going to be many defeats and many stumbles. Uh, but one needs a sense of purpose and a sense of, uh, of an ethical or moral goal. Now, people may not agree with that, but your, your role is to try to, with oration and some kind of decency, convince people of that. I think also Churchill speaks to us today that uh, the world does go through changes. And I'm glad you put the last picture up. The world had passed Churchill by. And I think sometimes uh, folks need to admit that it is time for a young, younger generation or the changed world to be put in other people's hands. And even though Churchill returned to power, it was, it was pretty clear the world had, had passed him by. Finally, it is to have the moral and ethical clarity to be able to see the uh, true nature of an enemy. And he saw that very much in fascism. Uh, he saw that in Stalinism. And let's be clear, in Stalinism, he saw that. And, and to be able to put that on the table is part of the discussion. So not to ignore it, not to whitewash it. And if you accept it, be conscious that that's what you're accepting. And that was particularly to the appeasers, like Halifax. Okay, you wanna make peace with the Nazis? You must truly know who they are. Okay, and then if you wanna make peace, you, you have to take the consequences, but you cannot plead ignorance. And God. early on, early on Churchill knew what <clears throat> Churchill, uh, excuse me, what Hitler and the Nazis were up to. They didn't, they didn't really do anything that surprised him it's just also at some point you realized strategy wasn't his best forte. <laughs> Let Montgomery and others do the strategy. He can sit back and do the politics. But in the end, keep going. And I think, uh, yeah, I keep going. And actually, um, in a very personal level, um, he suffered deeply from depression, deeply. Um, and it, it's a challenge, though. That's difficult. And some people do give in to that. And we shouldn't judge them because they give in to that. But Churchill is an example of what one could do, could do, you know, with the aid of a loving wife, right? A totally devoted wife. And let's be honest, the aid of alcohol. This is a, this is a gentleman who drank a lot. <laughs> okay, so we want to be very careful. Uh, he had allies in getting through, but he is an example of somebody who recognized his uh, black dog um, and was able to with the assistance of others, uh, wrestle and manage it. But it struck very often. I mean, he was debilitated by depression many times. Well, Professor Hoffenberg, I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and enthusiasm about. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Can I just show folks? Um, is this? I just want to point out that this is the most current, generally accessible book. Eric Larson Larson's a wonderful writer. Really, wonderful. He could be a novelist. He takes historical moments, and this discusses Churchill and his family life, primarily during the Blitz, but it includes the whole war. So if you're interested in Churchill in action during the war, uh, this is a very accessible book. I cannot tell you for legally where it's available, but it's available for a very recent, decent price, in a place which has very large wholesale items for sale. That's all I'll say. Okay. I won't say anything else. Thank All you very right. much. It was a pleasure. Thank you and cheers. Talk cheers. To you. Uh, cheers.